Welcome back to this week's Hush Life podcast. Today we have the opportunity to sit down with Daniel Richens of the RK Hunting Company. We discuss a variety of topics, including wildlife management, the hunting industry, and an entrepreneur mentality. Remember, the best thing you can do for this podcast is to subscribe and leave a rating on your favorite podcasting platform. It really drives us to create more content just like this. Thanks, guys, and enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of the Hush Life Podcast. We are sitting in the backyard, a beautiful sunny day here in Northwest Utah, joined by, um, as he's coined himself, his, his second favorite cameraman. Is that what you call yourself? Yeah, the second favorite cameraman. So, Matty Ice is here. Matt, you want to introduce our guest today? Yeah, guys. So, we are at the home of uh, one of my favorite guys and favorite role models, uh, Daniel Richens and his wife, Andrea. And... Uh, we are getting here today, hopefully, to pick his brain about kind of his entrepreneur mindset when it comes to the hunting industry and uh, kind of some crazy hunting stories, because I know he's got quite a few. The um, Yeah, Matt, Matt prefaced this with saying that <coughs> Daniel and his kind of right-hand man, business partner, and Jack of all trades up at the ranch, Cheeto, have a lot of wild stories over the years. <laughs> so I'm sure we'll definitely get into some of those, but... Um, Daniel and his wife own R&K Hunting Company. And if you guys have been following along for any amount of time over the last two years at least, you should uh, be quite familiar with their business, their brand. We actually just gave away a mule deer hunt that we uh, are super excited to be doing later this year in October. We actually found out our winner also last week. He is a local Utah person, which is the first time we've ever had that. So that's going to be exciting. We're going to be going up there chasing mule deer in October, and it's going to be his, uh, Caleb's opportunity for his very first mule deer. So pretty extra special there. But then we also spent time, man, we filmed our Can-Am Living the Land episode up there. We filmed Gage's first ever elk hunt up on RK. And it's where, honestly, we met Matt. Matt was our guide on Gage's yeah. hunt, and we'd kind of seen him and known him around a little bit, but Matt spent several years guiding up there. Yeah, it's really where I learned basically everything I know about hunting is from Daniel and Cheeto and the people at R&K, and uh, super grateful. They're like family and still are, and yeah, it's a special place. So we wanted to, we wanted to talk to Daniel, and there's... There's a cool story there. Like, if you guys have followed along by now, you kind of know that my passion, aside from the hunting stuff, is also just business and being an entrepreneur. And Daniel has a really interesting story, kind of how he got started into what he's doing today. Got a lot going on. Um, just from the outside looking in, there's a lot, a lot of logistics to deal with in this type of an industry. And I always applaud the outfitters that have... Um, so many various things happening at one time and are able to maintain the customer service and the experience that you would hope because it could easily go sideways i feel like but daniel welcome to the to the podcast well thanks for having us and me and my wife andrea but uh yeah it's been we've been pretty blessed as far as being able to do this for a living um hasn't been easy by any means and there's been a lot of times where we've thought about actually quitting um but, uh, yeah, we've got fantastic people that work with us, and that's what we always say. No one works for us. Everybody works with us. And uh, they're really all the credit goes uh, to the to our staff, our guides, and, and, you know, the customer service like you're mentioning and something that sets you apart from everybody else, you know, because you know, there's so many people in the industry and getting into the industry, and, and you have to figure out a way to win the tie. And that, in my opinion, comes down to how you treat people, how you communicate with them, and, you know, not over-promising and over-delivering and <clears throat> really just the small things. And that happens more often than not, not even on the hill, you know, prior to their hunt, where it starts in the office with Andrea talking to them. So. Absolutely. So walk us back to the to the old days. I'm super curious, like, how did you eventually first start this kind of road that you've been going down for quite a while and get into the idea of starting to guide an outfit? Well, I've always, I've always wanted to, um, be a guide, um, and do something out outside, whether, it, you know, be a rancher, be an outfitter, whatever it is. And, uh, I knew that at a very young age, 
Um, I remember talking to my dad and saying that I wanted to do this, you know, as early as 12 and 13 years old. But, uh, you know, we don't have any family land or anything like that. So um, when I was 14 and 15, um, I started making phone calls to some of the outfitters that are in the town, a couple, one in, in particular that I know, and seeing if that he would hire me as a guide. And he kind of just laughed and he says, you don't even have a driver's license. And so I said, well, I'll do anything. And so they would use me to scout. Um, when I did get my driver's license, they would use me to, to pack a lot of their animals off the hill. And so back in the day before there were cell phones, um, they would call the school. I went to North Summit. They would actually call the office and they would, then the office would beep you into class and say, you know, you got Daniel's got a phone call at the office or whatever and I'd go to the office it'd be this outfitter and he would say they had an animal down so I'd leave school come home get a truck and trailer and horses and then go up on the mountain and pack an elk off the hill and you know <laughs> he'd, he'd explain to me where it was and I'd have to try and find it and go do it at 16 and then and then as I got insurance wouldn't cover me and and so I think they started I think I did my first guiding when I was probably 17. Um, and then it's just kind of, well, I did my first guiding for other outfitters at 17, but I got my first hunting lease when I was 16 years old. So walk so. me through that process. Like you seem to be way ahead of your days as a 14, 15, 16 year old, A, to start wanting to go proactively, you know, work for somebody else and kind of cut your teeth, get the experience. And then B, to have like the vision and the, the, you know, drive as a 16 year old to try to go secure a lease. What was the mentality kind of behind that? And how did you go about getting it to be, I mean, it doesn't sound easy from an outsider's perspective to kind of go find a lease to even secure, like walk me through that process. Yeah. You know, back, and this is 25 years ago, um, or 20 years ago anyway. And, uh, but I mean, it was, no, it wasn't that long ago, was it? 20, I was 16. 640. Yeah, it was 20 years. Hell, I'm getting old. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, it was, you know, there, back when I started, there were, there were hunting clubs and a handful of outfitters. You know, there wasn't like today. I don't, I think it'd be very hard to recreate what we've been able to put together uh, from our NK standpoint today. I don't think, I actually don't even think it'd be possible to do it. But uh, it's something that I always wanted uh to do we didn't have anything growing up we didn't have we had we had a couple of horses and a two-place horse trader um no four-wheelers no ground no trampolines no you know i mean we had our fun on the hill we'd come yeah. off the, get off the school bus and go up on the hill and or go down to the river fishing and show up at dark back to the house and and that's that's kind of what we did so you know i always wanted to have something that I enjoyed. My dad worked seven days a week and, and did everything under the sun just to try to feed eight kids. But <clears throat> I had a real good friend up in Chalk Creek, east of Colville. His dad had a ranch up there. And so I would, I would ride the school bus to his house uh, on a Friday, night, a Friday, and I'd work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and come, and come back to my house uh, Sunday night and go to school again when I was young. And uh, when I first decided I wanted to take people hunting um i i talked to this landowner up chalk creek and what i did is i worked for two years um i put up uh three and a half miles of fence um and he wanted us to cut all of the the tea or the wood posts off of his ground so we would pound in five steel posts and then dig a three-foot hole bury a wood cedar post so we were cutting cedar posts off the ground dragging them behind the four-wheeler to where they needed to go and so i worked for two years for him and i traded him um three years worth of the hunting on 1200 acres and a two-year-old unbroke filly so that was my pay for two years. So and then, bartering 101 to get in the door. Bartering 101, yeah. yeah. And and my first clients uh, were some people that my were friends with my grandpa in Salt Lake City. And I would I took school off. I took football off. Put a tent up. I was the cook. I was the guide. I was the everything. I made them peanut butter sandwiches and hamburgers and spaghetti. That was the only <laughs> things I knew how to make. <laughs> we took them. Well, I took them up on the hill hunting, and and that had just kind of progressively grown over the years. Um, 
by the time I was 23 or 24, we were doing it pretty much full time. And so yeah. at that point in time, had you gone out and secured any additional property where you kind of maintained the, the that, that initial 1200 acres to, to kind of build off of from 16 to 20 something? Yeah. So every year I would add to that, okay. I, uh, the neighboring ground that I was trying to get, I would add to it and add to it and add to it. And then, um, I don't know if, if this is, some people remember United Sportsman. Um, so when I was, when did we get married? 23 or four, probably 23. So I bought into United Sportsman. I had, I had went and um, talked to a couple of landowners to lease their ground, and there's four of them. And back then it was called PHU, not a CWMU. It was called a private hunting unit. And there was four of them. Two of them wanted to lease to me. Two of them wanted to lease to United Sportsman. But we needed the entire acreage block to make it into a PHU at that time. And... Uh, so I I partnered with Cal Haskell and uh, and what I said is you take half the tags half the season and they they just sold hunting permits so you do it yourself come up and camp and do your own deal and and then I said you take half the season half the tags I'll take half the season half the tags and then uh, I got to be really good friends with Cal and Cal had some other leases that uh, we pulled in and made then that's really where we where we separated United Sportsman from being a non-guided hunt experience to a guided hunting experience. And uh, so we partnered and got that piece of ground. And then, you know, within three or four years, we, I went and met with a rancher in Wyoming and met him every day at six in the morning at McDonald's in Evanston. And, and he drove me around for seven days straight in his truck and showed me all the ground they had. They had from Evanston to Fort Bridger to Cameron, Wyoming, and I made him an offer when I was 23 and put a bid in on it, and we were able to get that bid. And so that just every year we've just been progressively growing, and uh, yeah, I've been pretty fortunate to have what we have now. Yeah, that's man, that's just like such a crazy experience. Just again, thinking to the 16 year olds that I know right now, and how few of them would be you know, in a position to try and go do something like that. Um, Particularly back then too, you know, you didn't have the luxury of, you know, some of the technology that's readily available for people to even help like identify possible landowners names. Like you had to do it kind of the old school way through networking. And no, you, I, I, I spent hours and hours and hours at the courthouse going through maps and looking at property ownership and who owned what and, you know, there was no Onyx. There was yeah. no, there was no nothing. You know, and even buying into United Sportsman, <clears throat> I I asked Cal if he was interested in a partner, which he wasn't for a year, and then I finally con- convinced him. And then when they when we came up with a value to buy into United Sportsman, I didn't have any money. Yep. And so, but I was doing a lot of concrete, a lot of flat work. And I did a job up in uh, Echo Canyon for a guy. He had a huge indoor or a barn. He wanted to make an indoor shop. And I did all the flat work in that barn. And I noticed to the side of the barn, he had a bunch of old logs that had been there for three or four years. And it was actually a log kit for a home and uh, that he had bought and was never using. And so I traded him the concrete work for all of those logs. And then I took the logs over to Heber one trailer load at a time and had them cope the corners and I build seven little cabins that were portable we pick them up and move them and that I use that as my initial buy-in to United Sportsman to become a partner with them it's like the the story where somebody takes like a a pen and continually trades up until they eventually have like a car you've like seen <laughs> you, have you seen those yeah. Yeah. and it's like a challenge almost and I, man it seems so similar to that like oh we've done we have done so much bartering and trading and you know labor building fences building high fences pushing in roads doing concrete just you know because we never did i mean we could barely afford to feed ourselves huh <laughs> well, that, that that's what's interesting, right? Is like you willed yourself to figure out a way to make it work when you didn't necessarily yeah. have the capital sitting around and, you know, just easily buy into these new properties or opportunities. You had to come up with an alternative means that still created enough value to the, you know, person or the landowner. 
And again, that's just such a unique uh, skill set and you know vision to to try to go secure that because a lot of people I feel like would stop because that's the barrier of entry. Like, well, I don't have any money to do that, so I guess you know we're not going to be able to make this one work out. Whereas you know your approach was getting super creative and figuring out like, okay, well, what's some stuff that you need that I can provide through yeah. labor, hard work, um, trade. And that was able to like get you over that kind of barrier of entry that a lot of people probably would have stopped at. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's hardly anything that you can't just figure out, you know, figure it out. We say that all the time. <clears throat> and, and you obviously have to have a, a very supportive partner. Yeah. It was, uh, when we had our first kid, um, McCain, I remember having, I mean, I'd be up all night long doing numbers and figuring out ways to try and make the business better or make it so we could be full time. Because for years and years, we weren't full time by any means. We would we would just hunt during the hunting season. And then, I mean, I'd shoot, shoot horses for 16 years. I was, I welded, I poured a ton of concrete. I did plumbing, HVAC. I had an excavation company. I had a crane. I, I mean, I tried everything in under the sun to make a living and i think it was year seven and i remember after having mccain and not having any insurance and the medical bills talking to andrea and saying <clears throat> maybe i'd be better off just getting a job at the the county or at the cement plant which is five miles down the road because they had benefits and they had uh, you know insurance and whatever and and it was year seven before we were out of the uh, red and into the black and I think we had less than three thousand dollars that year but I remember being so happy that we we finally weren't upside down we weren't carrying deposits from the next year to pay for bills for this year you know and it was seven years into it and, and there was a lot of times that I was like you know really questioned myself whether we were going to actually be able to do this as a living and uh what kept you going, like through those challenging t times? Because I know we've we've talked to a lot of people and I've read a lot of stuff, <clears throat> and it seems in most cases like anything that's like eventually successful business wise often takes about a ten year run for it to finally like really kind of settle in as a successful venture. And leading up to that ten years, to your point, you may be in a really tough position financially, you know, emotionally because it's super stressful when you're trying yeah. to provide for your family. What kept you kind of going to want to stay the course oh probably my wife more than anything actually um so most people can't work with their spouse <laughs> or their family <laughs> but we have a great working relationship and she, she's got you know when i was when when i would be down and saying this isn't going to work or like i don't think i've ever heard her one time ever say that this won't work or we can't figure it out so she's out constantly saying we can do this, we can do that, you know, I mean, she, or, or honestly, I don't think, I think I probably would be working for somebody else if it wasn't her reassuring that we can actually do it. And, and, you know, I remember, I remember, you know, getting clients was a big problem. I could have the ground, but if you didn't have any hunters, then, you know, it didn't do you any good. You could have all the ground in the world. And if you didn't have hunters, then, then, you know, you weren't making any money. And I remember driving to Sydney, Nebraska, to Cabela's multiple times. And before we could email a picture or whatever, just with a printed off picture and a photo album saying, here's what we killed, here's what we can offer, here's what we're doing, and being turned down year after year after year. <clears throat> Four or five years in a row, they wouldn't accept me as an outfitter to book for me. And then we, we flew to a show in Pennsylvania and and I walked up to the booth, and they all had known me because I'd been bugging them for years. And I had a, a brand new shiny photo album with, <laughs> you know, just pictures, three by five pictures in it. And and I gave it to them. And and by then we had we had a CD at the time, so I'd burned music onto a, a CD. My brother did it for me, and we had a 15 minute little promotional deal. And and they finally said that they would book for us, and and they. That's really what kind of got us over the edge because I had access to the property, but I, I didn't have access to the hunters. Yeah, right, because back then, what was the standard protocol? I mean, websites weren't really that much of a thing, so uh, it was probably just word of mouth. <coughs> Going to hunting shows. Hunting shows, yeah. Hunting shows, word of mouth, and booking agents. 
you know Cabela's was the largest booking agent and they just but they have a heck of a rec- reputation and they just weren't willing to put their name on you know an a new guy right? a new guy that yeah. they hadn't been with or vetted and sure and we went from uh they booked four hunters with us the first year um a group from dupont and with a chemical company uh, ag chem and uh, i think in the top of our seasons they were probably booking over 200 250 hunters with us wow. and then that's gone the other way to where you know i'm i'm still loyal to cabela's as far as giving them certain dates and you know in the premium of the season and they bring out their top their top employees or their top clients or whatever and they'll do some hunts with us but you know it's gone from booking 250 clients with us to you know maybe 20 mm-hmm. um so yeah that, that's in long long and short that's kind of how how it's played out yeah and to give everybody an idea andrea is sitting here listening uh we're having yeah. some issues with the mic so uh <laughs> that's part of the reason why she's not being able to kind of speak up and contribute after being such a huge part of the the success i'm impressed by all measures that you guys can work together as a husband and wife couple because to your point daniel not easy for a lot of people to work with their spouse or their immediate family I've only met a handful of people, the company that does uh, all of our screen printing and embroidery and fulfillment, Eagle Eye, they are an, also an anomaly where they work together as a family and spend all of their time together. It's like, And they yeah. never argue. They never fight. Like <clears throat> They're so great. So yeah. it's very rare that you see that because I love my family dearly. There's just no way though, that it would work. <laughs> There's no yeah. way. It's, no, it, it is extremely rare. And and I won't take any of the credit for that. It's it's her on that deal, but you know from it would amaze you how many of the hunters when they come out their first question is, "Am I going to be able to meet Andrea when I'm out there?" Because she communicates with them all year long, yeah, and you know tells them what to expect, what to bring, who's going to pick them up at the airport. She gets her licenses. She, you know, the stuff that gets done in the office is is the not fun stuff well it's what it's what sets up the hunt to to begin a great experience right yeah a lot of the the clients that you have are busy business people that are coming in or on the on the maybe the contrary there's somebody that is saved up for a lot of years and this is kind of like their one chance to come and maybe shoot an elk or a mule deer and there's a lot of logistics that go into getting it going from travel to what tags to accommodations to gear you name it and I think that's the differentiator between like a great outfitting and guide company and one that's maybe not as great as the communication and the expectations that are set up front. Sure. We, we talk to people that have horrible experiences all the time from Alaska to, you know, anywhere in the West because predominantly like a lot of it wasn't teed up to begin with. Sure. And then when they get there, that kind of continues and lags over into the hunting experience. And I think yeah. that's the real difference maker for, frankly for any business but yeah. certainly one like this yeah for sure i mean you can ruin a hunt before it even starts yeah you know or you can turn it into a positive experience Bef- I, i've always said that i mean there's so many outfitters that that uh and i hear them every day i mean literally every day i get you know probably a hundred phone calls and and i hear people who have had bad experiences with outfitters yeah and i've always said the only thing you need to do to become a successful outfitter is just do what you say you're gonna do yeah. i mean and it really it boils down to that do what you say you're going to do so if you're you know don't over promise something and then not do it don't it's just it's very simple to be in my mind it's you know to be successful just do what you say you're gonna do you can always find something to blame a bad hunt on and this is another thing i've always you know i've always said if i can't put you in front of a deer or an elk in five days and you have an opportunity to harvest a deer or an elk then i shouldn't be selling that as a hunt yeah you know whether it's bad weather whether it's a full moon whether it's hot whether it's you know you break down get a flat tire take all those into consideration if i cannot put a deer elk in front of you in five days i shouldn't be selling that hunt. yeah because everybody blames it on something they had a bad hunt and you know it was hot and those are factors in a hunt for sure sure. but but you need to have the quality of ground that even that with that being a factor you can still have a successful hunt and a successful hunt is not just harvesting an animal you know i I would say that's probably the you know we we've taken the approach that that's 
that's above and beyond your hunt. Yep. Like we're going to control all of the controllables. You can have great attitude from the guides to the cook to the help to the person picking up at the airport. Attitudes are going to be great. The equipment's going to be good. The food's going to be outstanding. You know, everything's going to be comfortable. We're going to control everything we can possibly control because there's so many things that you can't control on a mm-hmm. hunt. You know, and if you do that, then regardless of whether you get an animal or not, you you've still had a successful hunt. I think it's important too for um, these kind of things is finding out what is the, what kind of an experience does the client want to have? You know, because a lot of people yeah. have different expectations. Some oh, some sure. folks are all about trying to shoot the biggest thing they can possibly find, and that's the only thing that matters. But a lot of other people, they want to just get away from life and have a good experience and be out in the yeah. mountains. And you know what? If they get something awesome, but it yeah. isn't necessarily like the driving factor behind yeah. whether or not they view it as like a successful hunt. Sure. No, that, that's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, we, we book people every day and, and I tell people that they wouldn't be a good fit every day too, you know. So if I don't have something that they're looking for, I'll let them know right out of the gate or refer them to other outfitters that, you know, maybe have what they're looking for. And I don't try to just get the sale to get the sale. Yeah. You know, because, you know, that's never going to end up good if you just book somebody and you don't have what they're looking for. But I would say almost every single hunt, short of the guys that, I mean, we've had clients that have been with us ever since we started, 20 plus years. But uh, new people that come out, by the, by the time their hunt is over, I would say almost everybody has looks at the hunt in a different way. You know, because they come out thinking just what you were saying, you know, I need to kill an animal, I need to get something this size or score this big or whatever. And when we, and then they may meet a guide like Matt and take him up on the hill and, and we'll point out a sunset to him mm-hmm. or a sunrise, you know, or the wildflowers or stuff that, you know, they're not even looking at. They're so laser focused on an animal rather than the experience. I mean, I can't tell, tell you how many people I've said, look at that. And, you know, they think that I'm pointing to an animal. And then they're like, well, what are you looking at? I'm like, look at that sunset. Yeah. And I'm videoing it, you know, and it just changes their their focus on the hunt. Speaking of that, so as a business owner, and you've been doing this a long time now, what do you look for in a guide when you're maybe trying to add somebody to your team? Because obviously there's a lot of young, <coughs> young folks that would love to kind of get that first opportunity to go cut their teeth as a guide. So what are some of the core competencies or skill sets or traits that, that you guys really kind of try to identify? Uh, well, they have to be honest. You know, they've got to be honest. They've got to be really good with people. I'd rather take, I'd rather a hundred times over take somebody who ha- who's honest and has a great personality and is willing to learn than someone who says, I've done everything, you know, shows up and says, I've guided in every state and every animal and, you know, I'm the best of the best of the best. Well, that's not the attitude that, that R&K really has. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we need guys that... I want guys that stay humble. They need to be able to listen and take direction. And you have to wear different hats, you know, because you're with a different person every five days that's got a different personality. Some people want you to talk to them all for five days. Some people don't want want you to listen to them for five days, right? Some people want you to teach them and show them what you're doing. Some people think they know everything. You know, you have to be able to get along with somebody for five days, which... We say in all of our guide meetings, you can get along with anybody for five. I can get along with anybody for five days. Yeah. You know, but the handful of people, it's not even a handful. I mean, out of 500 hunters, it'll be less than one or two that that have an issue. And it's generally a miscommunication from a booking agent standpoint. It's nothing from. So the people that come out and hunt are, are very, very good, you know, people and We've had a few. We've had a few that we've uninvited to come back, but that list is very small. But as far as as far as a guide, you just need to be able to be willing to work and learn and and be humble. You know, I can teach you because we're we're a service based company. We provide a service. Yep. So, you know, the controllables, the little things, the attitude. Um, we can teach you how to hunt. Matt, yeah. what advice do you, th- having been a guide for a lot of years, anybody that's listening that might be maybe considering going into becoming a guide, what kind of advice would you give them? Yeah, um, biggest thing that jumps out to me is try and get with an outfitter that mirrors a lot of R&K's attributes. Um, 
the thing that sets R and K apart now that I've been able to hunt around separate outfitters in different states is the way we work as a team. It's such a huge team factor at R and K. We're like brothers. It's the same group of guides normally every year. We hunt really well together. We keep no secrets, like literally zero secrets, and that's that's such a big part to having a successful hunting company. I think is uh, working as a team and. Gosh, it's just crazy hunting with some other outfitters, the way they compete against each other, and it's just like everybody's going around each other's backs. But uh, biggest advice, like Daniel said, is just be honest, have a good work ethic, and you can never, it's okay to be wrong, it's okay to admit that you're wrong, but never never try and act like you know everything because the second you think that you're going to get slapped in the face with reality because <laughs> there's always somebody that's better than you always somebody that knows more than you and once you accept that fact and just are humble i think there's a lot of room to excel and a lot of room to grow and uh it was crazy because like my first year guiding i was 18 18 years old um and i had killed several deer and several elk on my own and uh i remember uh meeting cheeto at a hunting expo and he was like yeah i i kind of follow you on instagram would you like to come work for us and i was like yeah and it was crazy because i was the first year i guided i was like the only new guide and being able to have some of these guides that have been guiding for 20 years take me under their wing and show me all these tips and tricks and I found a big deer and they let me go hunt the big deer instead of a guy that had been guiding for 20 years. And it was like, they gave me a lot of leash. Yeah. And I think that that really is what sparked my love for R&K and the people behind R&K was they trusted me and they let me run. And uh, it's just been super fun to be able to learn so much. Like, I tell people this all the time. If, if you want to get into like the hunting industry or become a proficient hunter, there's no better way than to guide. I mean, I don't know how many animals I helped skin a year when I was guiding full time, probably a hundred yeah. at the skinning rack. And you'll never be able to help skin or pack out a hundred animals doing any other thing. Like yeah. there's no way. That's what I, I stood out to me is the, um, the volume you guys are capable of just a lot, a lot of because of the land that you've eventually, you know, over that time span been able to acquire, which translates into a lot of hunts. I don't remember the number. I know you would probably know it, but how many, like between deer, elk, moose, what kind of total number of hunts do you guys typically try to run a year? Well, we're, we're around probably 500 hunts yeah, that's what I and thought. They're, they're all a fi- you know, a fully guided five day meals, lodging, transportation yep. to and from the airport. That's between deer, elk, moose, um, mountain lion and bear. Okay. And so you can do anything from, you know, we have camps in Wyoming that are horseback wall tent camps yep. and level five physical and that whole experience to, you know, private property lodge hunts yep. on, on private land and, and re- archery, rifle, muzzleloader, crossbow, anything in between. You know, if you, uh, we do a lot of, of disabled hunts and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, some hunts we've been fortunate enough to give away to, to charity for multiple different reasons but if i mean if you're in wheelchair and not mobile we can get you on something or if you want to you want to hike or ride a horse 25 miles a day then we have that and everything in between yeah very so, accommodating to a yeah. wide group of hunters yeah so i mean when someone someone starts to hunt with us they can hunt a different species in a different state and they literally can hunt 10 or 12 years without doing the same thing twice yep the reason I, I bring that up is to Matt's point about work ethic. Um, that really was what stood out when we first met Matt uh, on Gage's elk hunt was yeah. the effort and the hustle that he put in. And then just like talking through and how many hunts he had been on previous to that and how many he had kind of after that. And just the amount of, you know, at kill site experience you, you, you gain in a season is really unlike most other operations anywhere 
And it's again, based tied back into that volume and also the team component, right? Where a lot of times Matt's client may have already tagged out and then he's jumping over to help somebody else pack out a successful kill. And so he was just explaining like how many freaking deer and elk and moose he was packing out in a season. We're just like, oh my gosh, that's, that is like an insane amount of effort. Because, you know, most of them, you're packing out on your backpack. You're not just driving up in a truck and throwing them in. Very different than some of them out there. But what a great experience builder for anybody. I think, you know, something like breaking down an animal is one of those deals where with repetition, like anything, you become more proficient. You get better and it becomes easier. And a lot of times um, folks aren't you know, able to have that experience as much because you maybe only have one tag in, in your season. And. If, if, if it's not successful, it could be a couple of years before you get back on an animal and trying to remember how to break it down. So you just gain a lot of proficiencies. Glassing is another one that stands out. Spent so much time glassing up there. It's a muscle memory thing. You just get better yeah. as you do it more frequently. So that, uh, that was one thing that stood out. I was like, dude, you're packing off a lot of critters in yeah. a year as a guide. Yeah, those our guides, you know, hats off to all the guides. If someone gets an animal down and they come back to lunch, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a guide put a plate of lunch down, hasn't taken one bite of it, and, and walked out the door to go back up on the hill to carry something off for another hunter. Yeah. So, you know, if somebody gets one down, everybody that's available goes and helps until it's off the mountain and taken care of the right way and, you know, and they- just... And, it's a it's a very it's we don't have to ask them to do it yeah you know everyone wants to do it they they know that's what's expected of them and it's it's not really a it didn't feel like a job to us you know yeah i don't think it feels like a job to a lot of our guides you know they they and they're the ones that bring the client back right so well, another thing we like to do uh on i've been on quite a few guided hunts too and i never guide the guide i let him you know to say whatever he wants but we we try to involve the hunter in all of our decision decisions whether they're it may be their very first hunt they've ever been on maybe their 50th hunt or 100th hunt they've been on so if we go if we see an animal we'll you know we'll say well here's where he's laying down how do you think the best way to sneak in on him or what do you think what to do for tonight or you know involve your client in the because they soon go from a client to a friend, you know, in just a couple of days. Yeah. And so you're hunting together, you know, you, you ask them for their opinion and what they think. Or, or if you do something, you explain, here's what we're going to do and here's why we're going to do it this way. Yeah. You know, because a lot of people, and, you know, I may be wrong on this, but myself, I like to learn. Every, everywhere I go, I like to learn why do you do that and what is what's the reasoning behind that or what made you decide to do this versus this and the, our guides are open with you know sharing with the client here's here's why we're doing it this way you know and and if the client has a different way or wants to do a different way then we ultimately do it the way that the you know the client wants to do it sure. so you know people like to be involved in decision making and and they're spending a lot of money mm-hmm. to come out on a on a hunt and you know, they did, no one likes just to be told, go here, do that, sit here. You know, I mean, they want to be, it's a team effort when you're on the hill. A lot more fun that way, for sure, right? Yeah. When you're part of it, not yeah. just, you know, being told, here, do this, do that. I agree, too, that uh, the, the teamwork thing really stands out. You know, we don't do a ton of guided hunts. However, some of the ones we've been on, like, it is very competitive between the, the individual guides and, you know, the... They, even when they may have tagged out, they're kind of still holding back on some intel that might lead them to a successful like second season hunt or something. When there's clients currently in camp that are not, you know, Struggling. tagged out yet. So yeah. that's something that I think, you know, just from like the, the the lens of the customer is really nice when you have a team of people working on together on the same page to help all the clients out that are in camp, not just your particular hunter. And obviously it goes to the idea that if you have everybody happy and, you know, a good chance they're going to come back or, you know, recommend you to one of their friends or colleagues or something. And it's fun to see a culture of people that, although driven and alpha males and competitive, still willing to, like, come together and help each other out for the betterment of the business. Yeah. And that's what it is. You know, it's it's a business. Everyone's got to be on the same page. And, and there can't be any – there can't be any – secrets or camp champs or anything like that you know i mean if that's your mindset it's it's gonna fail you know pretty quick so you've had an opportunity obviously to experience a lot of amazing hunts 
with uh, with all your years of, of this experience, what stands out as like your favorite species to hunt, number one? I know we've uh, debated religiously back and forth of what ours is, and it oftentimes kind of teeters between the mule deer person that's just a very, very passionate mule deer hunter, or obviously the elk crowd, and back and forth, I'm very curious if that's if those two rank at your top, or if you have a different species that you're really passionate about hunting. No, those are those probably rank at the top. Um, probably, I probably enjoy hunting mule deer a little bit more than I enjoy hunting all of them. You know, archery, and I enjoy archery hunting a lot. I I enjoy rifle hunting, but uh, and when elk are in the rut and just going crazy, it's pretty hard to you know have anything that beats that. That's just but outsmarting and trying to find a big trophy mule deer is is one of the hardest things that we do and i just that that's what i enjoy probably hunting more than anything just because of the challenge of trying to find a big one number one and then outsmarting and getting number two it's you know we've had a lot of deer every year that that we've got on trail cameras or we've seen we've we've got them on phone scopes and and we never we have 60 days to hunt and a lot of these deer we never get. So we're on the mountain 60 days hunting a particular deer every single day, and a lot of them we never get. So Chalk one up for Team Mule Deer, Matt's smiling. Yeah, and, and you have to have, a you know, <laughs> a lot of respect for an animal like that, you know. Um, that uh, we have places on all of our ranches that are sanctuaries. Like if they make it into those places, it's off limits to hunting. Really? Yeah. Walk me through for, that, that. For multiple reasons. Yeah, I'd love to um, hear about that. Uh, you know, it may be right on a boundary where if you go in there, you can push them off of your ground. You know, elk and, are very susceptible to being pushed and moved. And if they if they find a place they're going to get less pressure, they're going to stay there and they're not going to come back. So, you know, just from a st- strategic standpoint, you don't want to go into an area that holds a lot of elk and, and hunt it the wrong way. You know, a lot of areas on the ranch, we hunt one way from the, our, obviously our boundaries in to try and keep all of the animals. But, um you have to, with as much pressure as you can put on animals nowadays, you have to have places on all of your leases that is a sanctuary. That if they make it to there, it doesn't matter if it's day five of your guy's hunt, you're not going in there with a rifle and blowing them out of there. Mm-hmm. If they get in there, they're, they've won, they're safe. We'll shoot them as they come out of there or go back into there, but once they're in there, they're off limits. And, you know, it's it goes back to... A little bit of obviously keeping the animals on the ground, but it's you know it's kind of a respect deal too. I mean, if you got beat by that deer or that elk, you know you got beat by him. Yeah, and try to outsmart them, and you know there you don't have to. Not every animal on the mountain's got to die. Yeah, talk a little bit about the conservation uh, efforts and thought that you guys put into managing your property and just i know you have a lot of involvement with uh, utah department of wildlife and give us a little bit more insight into what it's like uh to to kind of navigate through some of those complex issues but just in general like your philosophy for the properties that you do have sure um so i mean i if i possibly can i I want the control the grazing the recreation and the hunting on every piece of ground i have that doesn't happen on all of them, but it does on a fair amount of them because they all go hand in hand. And if you're heavy on one thing, you can hurt the other. So if you overgraze a piece of ground, then it's not going to be good for hunting. You can push the deer and elk right off of it. If you put sheep in an area versus cattle in an area, you can push the animal right off of it. Um, it so we do a lot of habitat improvement projects every year uh, with different entities. Uh, Mule Deer Foundation, SFW, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, the DWR. Uh, we'll do, you know, lop and scatter on the juniper trees. We do a lot of a lot of spring development. We'll do cross fencing so we can do ro- rotational grazing and leave certain pastures. You know, every other year they get grazed, so it's a rotational grazing that's better for the for the ground. Uh, we do a lot of, I mean. Every year we have multiple projects going on, you know, whether it be reseeding the winter range, um, anything to just help that habitat. Because ultimately, if you don't have the right ground and the right feed, then you're not going to have any animals, you know. But all of these ranches, too, are a lot of them are third, fourth, fifth generation ranches. So, you know, when we're hunting up there, you may run into a sheep herder. 
with five dogs following behind his horse and, you know, pushing a thousand head of sheep. And there may, may be multiple herders on that ranch. And, then, and also, there may be cattle on the ranch. And then, aside from that, they may have been leasing out the recreation. So you're dealing with horse rides or ATV rides. or So these ranches nowadays have multiple streams of revenue, and you have to try and manage all of those without hurting any of them, really. Yeah. You know, so... Yeah, just, I can imagine it's complex too, just dealing with the fact that a lot of the property is leased, having to deal with like the families maybe that are owning the ranch, the entities that are helping with the conservation sure. initiatives. There's just a lot of moving parts to make it all come together. Um, yeah. With you kind of having to be the architect behind this is why we want to do these things, not only for you know the hunting component of it, but also helping the operational ranch on grazing side of it, making sure that it doesn't interfere with the recreation if they're kind of involving that. Just a lot of stuff going on <laughs> throughout the course of the year to like have it to where everyone is able to utilize the property that's going to be most beneficial to them, which isn't too different from like public conservation components, right? Where there's a lot of different entities that are all trying to get a multi-use component, you know, to the land that benefits everybody, not just one group. Sure. I mean, one of my leases, uh, there's 26 different landowners that comprise that one lease. Wow. Uh, 26 different families, 26 different contracts, 26 different personalities. <laughs> you know, some of them are a handshake agreement. Some of them are a 30-page lease, you know. So balancing that and being able to keep the core property together is a challenge in and of itself so you got to be able to get along with and that that falls back to communication you know you get you you can't get tied up getting so busy doing other stuff or focusing on your business that you don't communicate with the people you're leasing their ground if they need help doing something or you know just checking in and saying here's our plan here's what we're doing do you, do you need anything done can we help you or whatever and you know to sending out the lease payments to you know I mean, Andrea's kept relationships with landowners key, you know, you've got to be, you've got to keep a relationship open communication because, you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings if you, if you don't keep that line open. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it can create a lot of problems. So with, uh, with all the stuff you got going on, do you have time to go out and do hunting of your own? <laughs> um, I did a brown bear hunt on Kodiak Island this year that's been on my bucket list for a long time. and uh, Unreal. Yeah, it was a fan. Took my two boys and it was fantastic, fantastic experience. I've uh, I loved every minute of it. So we, we did a, our first taste of Alaska was two years ago. We did a Kodiak blacktail hunt. So it was a boat-based transporter hunt. And we saw six bears during that week we saw two sets of moms with cubs and then one large boar at about 300 yards and i was with logan and uh, our friend dylan from onyx and i w we were just all like chin just dropped when you see one of those big boars no. even at 300 yards which to me is still quite a ways away but yet close enough to be like all right we're not going to go that direction yeah. it was really something else <laughs> Yeah. I'd love to hear more about like how did that take place? What time of year was it? How many bears did you see? Oh, geez, he he had a cancellation. Lance Cromberger. Oh yeah, and okay. a good friend of mine, Mike Taylor, called and said if you can make up your mind in four days, he's got an opening for. Because I was on the list to go in 2028, and uh, and I called him and I said if I can bring my boy, can I bring my boy? And he says yeah, you can you can bring your boy. It shouldn't be a problem. But I could tell he wouldn't a big fan of it and then i called him back and i said can i bring my second boy and then he really was a big fan of it and he's like you know this is really no place for kids and this and that. i said well my kids are gonna be help they're not gonna be a hindrance and i had to kind of convince him that it's not you know it's gonna be no more babysitting for the guide and this and that and the other and, and by the end of that hunt he had offered both of my kids a job nice and <laughs> said to give him his card and his number and said both of you guys can come back up and but uh we did it in, when did I go, May or something, May? I think we did it in May. I killed the bear on day eight. We were seeing 20 bears a day. Wow. Um, 
It was unbelievable. It was, it was absolutely unbelievable. And it's completely different than like my, I, I have a camp east of Jackson Lake in Wyoming, and we have major grizzly problems in that camp. You know, we'll lose one out of every four elk to a grizzly. We'll come in and mock charge you and, and at 10, 15 yards and take the elk we killed. So going from having nuisance and problem grizzlies and maulings all the time in Wyoming and Montana and everywhere that they can't be hunted to a bear that's two and three times bigger that sees you or hears you or smells you and runs as hard as he can run the other direction is pretty astonishing to see. Did you guys get dropped off in like a float plane? Yeah. Okay. yeah we, we flew to from here to Seattle, Seattle to Anchorage, Anchorage to Kodiak, then got on a float plane in Kodiak and went to the tip of Kodiak and yep. landed on a on a lake and right to a tent and then uh, we'd walk every morning up onto a lookout point and we would glass and the, the guide would make the call whether the bear was big enough to get a closer look at or whether it was a boar or a sow or and uh, it, it was it was an awesome experience I, I would do it again in a heartbeat and just and just to have the the time because my boys work with me, so I'm with them every day and do stuff with them every day, but it's work related, you know, to to take time off and go on a hunt like this and you know, it's a it's a large investment to go on a on a hunt like that, but it's worth every penny. It, yeah. I, I wouldn't have done it if I couldn't have been there with my boys. Yeah, what a cool experience. So uh when when you finally got the green light of like, yeah, that's the boar that we need to go make a move on, how did it all go down? He was coming towards us, and uh, we had snuck in, and we had a couple of stalks prior to that that we got winded, and they just took off. I mean, huge bears. The bear I ended up killing was 9'4", and I don't know what he weighed. He, would, he was just enormous, but he was coming to us, and about, at about 500 yards, he turned and just started walking kind of parallel to us up a canyon, and my guide uh, pulled out a... A predator call and hit a predator call so i'm in prone position and the furthest they've ever shot you know they want those bears under 200 yards when you hit them because they're just so big and tough and and he turned started walking away until he heard this predator call then i mean he literally spun on a dime and started walking right at us and so he gets to about 250 yards and i'm laying down prone and i have him i can easily take him and my guides want him to get closer get closer so He's coming closer, closer, he, and he's working this call. Well, he goes from a walk to a lope, so he starts loping right at us. <laughs> and I have my two boys each running a camera, you know, kind of over my shoulder. So I, I go from laying down. As, as he's running towards us, he gets into some alders, and you know, I don't have a shot at him anymore. And I'm looking at this patch of alders, and, it, and we're, on a little, we're on a little mound, you know, halfway up a hill, and he's running up the hill towards us. And I'm looking at this patch of alders, and I see that, that when he comes out, he's going to be at 30 yards. I have no shot until he comes out. So I go from being prone to pulling my bipod all the way out to being on my knees. And and you can see they videoed it. And, I mean, I, I'm like, this bear's running at us. And so I pick my gun up, and I check to make sure I've got one in the bear. I knew I did, <laughs> but I double-checked to make sure. And... uh so I'm on my knees now, and I have my scope turned all the way down, and, and I can just see his forehead and his hump just running, bouncing towards us, loping towards us. And then I turn to my, and my guide's like, shoot him, shoot him. I'm like, I, you know, I don't, I don't have any shot going through those trees, you know. I said, I'm going to have to wait till he pops out, and then I'll shoot him as soon as he comes out. So then I go from kneeling to standing because now he's so close I can't get the angle on him. So now I'm standing and shouldering the gun, and... I look and my kids are progressively backing up the hill, <laughs> still videoing though, but they're way behind me now. And and my guide's like, shoot him, shoot him. And he came out at 35 yards and I shot him and, and he whirled and ran straight off the hill out of sight. And then, and I'd been telling my guide the whole time, don't back me up, don't back me up unless my head's in his mouth. Do not shoot at my bear. And he wasn't a fan of that. He says, this is my, I was his 51st brown bear hunt. And he says, I've put bullets in every one of them. I yeah. says, well, don't put them in mine unless you have to. And so he whirled and ran down off the hill and, and we picked him back up at about 250, 300 yards going up the opposite face. And I had double lunged him. 
and uh, he was slowing down and then i had to hit him four more times with the 300 prc 212 grain bullet and they're incredibly incredibly tough, tough. yeah and That's, then the, most of those guys that i've ever talked to it's like a like there there is no debate they are no, shooting yeah. the second you shoot they're shooting yeah absolutely yeah yeah and you know you have a bear of that size coming to something that he wants to eat, and you're 30 yards away. I mean, if he, he was close enough, that if, if he would have turned and ran towards us, then away from us, I wouldn't have been able to rack another bullet in and get a shot at him by the time he would have been on you. Yeah. So that's why they've got the gun. And For sure. Too. But he turned away and, and ran away. But And then, you know, the whole experience with the bear and my kids being there, and then my youngest kid... I mean, the height on those things is 110 pounds. Yeah. So my youngest kid threw it on his back, and the guide kind of laughed and says, you want to pack it out? And he's like, sure. And so it, he put it on him, and he, I mean, bugs. He wasn't, he's not, he, he's tough kid. McCain had all my gear. He was packing my backpack, my gun, my spot and scope. So my kids, they doubled as my little pack mules and Sherpas <laughs> for the eight days. But uh, what was the, uh, how are you, how are you feeling when you were, on the gun standing like do you i wasn't i wasn't shaking that like my guide yeah. i could tell that he you know and we had talked a lot and he got to know me uh over the the eight days and and whatever but you know i mean i like i said i double checked to make sure i had one in the barrel but i was 100 percent confident that when that bear come out i was gonna hit him yeah like i was i wasn't gonna turn and run like i was gonna hit him and i was gonna follow up with another one and I was I was ready for it. Did you have like an adrenaline dump after it was all said and done, and the bear was down, and you you know at any point in time? Because I, I just I've always envisioned you know one of those Kodiak or coastal brown bears that is truly yeah. a, a different caliber of predator. Oh, it would yeah. be such a different kind of like f- buck fever, if you will, that yeah. you get. Um, yeah, I mean, for sure. I, I definitely had a shot of adrenaline, but mm-hmm. for sure. But I wouldn't say that it was like once it was over and done that I that I processed like how many ways that could have went bad. Yep. You know, I didn't, I wasn't really nervous that way. I was, it was, it was just something I, I, I dreamt of doing forever. And, and I wasn't going to go on it. I told Andrea, I'm like, that's a crazy amount of money and I can't be gone for 10 days and 14 days and and she just said you're going and so anyway kudos to her for letting me go on it (laughs) mainly telling me to go on it but it it was uh i think i'd been anticipating it for so long it wasn't at no point in time was it was there ever a letdown or yeah or uh, did i get felt scared i mean i was nervous going up there just because of the interaction we have with the bears in wyoming you know i mean they're they are not like the bears in wyoming you know, a grizzly sees you in Wyoming and doesn't run away from you. It comes at you, yeah. or it'll charge you, or it'll maul you. Up there, if they if they smell you, they're out of there. You yeah. know, I mean, you can get in a bad spot if you wound a bear and it gets in the alders, sure. right? You know, and stuff can go south that way. But That's, other than that, after day two or three, I mean, I didn't I didn't feel nervous. Yeah, at all. settled in. Yeah. That was like we were kind of told, you know, if you guys get a deer down, just you know, have an escape route try to get the wind right don't yeah. horse around like get it processed yeah, soon get out. Yeah. you know and then basically like if the bear wants the deer just give them the deer give them the deer they yeah. don't want you they just want the deer yeah and uh when we were up there they actually had a, a neighboring boat had an encounter and they ended up shooting one of the the sows with cubs yeah which was unfortunate because they, they just they made a, a calculated error after they killed a deer and they kind of continued hunting and hung it up and came back and had an issue with the bear mm-hmm. and you know, that's a whole nother ball of wax when you got to get Alaska Fish and Wildlife involved and yeah. investigations and certainly nothing that we wanted to mess around with. But, um, yeah, isn't it interesting that the the grizzlies that are interior in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana oh, are honestly worse well, wait, than the giant worse. Kodiak bears? Far worse. Yeah. yeah. That, you know, they haven't been hunted for 40 plus, you know, 45 years. There's, there's, they're not afraid of anything. And, uh. Yeah, but my Jackson camp is, you know, it's not uncommon in there. We'll, there's some days you'll see over 10 grizzlies in that camp on an elk hunt. And, uh, you know, a rifle shot is a dinner bell, and yep. literally is a dinner bell. They hear a gun go off, and you will have a bear around you, you know. Which and, I've heard, like, the hunting up in those kind of regions of, you know, just outside of Yellowstone can be incredible elk hunting. But yeah. 
It's different elk hunting though. They don't they don't respond to a call. They the, you know they're bugling. It's just like where there's wolves, right? The, yeah. the predators have changed the habits of the of the prey on how they act and how they react and what you have to do to hunt them and get close to them and everything else. So yeah, but. I know you've had a, a lot of involvement too with predator management on your guys' place and kind of working with uh, the Department of Wildlife on trying to change some of like the old school ways that maybe tag allocations were given for mountain lions predominantly. Yeah. Can you give the, the people listening just like an, maybe just an idea like from your perspective on the amount of lions that you yeah. guys see in a year? Because I think it's pretty, I don't know all the details, but I've heard enough about it through you and Cheeto and stuff where. It's way more than anybody would ever expect. Oh, yeah, by far. So, so I mean, our, our deer population in the state is has gone down so far from what it was in the 70s and 80s and even the early 90s, you know. And that we just weren't putting, we didn't know. I mean, some, you know, I knew how many that lions were killing, but, you know, we didn't have any collar data on the cats. We didn't, everyone just assumed they knew a lion was killing 50 deer per year. Well, the last study that has come out shows that they're killing 125 deer per cat per year. Wow. And, I mean, the first year, we had a bad winter kill in 2018-19. We lost 75% of our deer population. So we went from 10,500 deer down to 2,500 deer in one winter. And and that winter, I really worked over the fishing game and the DWR to get away from the draw system for the lions. Because, you know, when you're in a draw system, it takes a resident eight, nine, ten years to draw a tag. You're trophy hunting. Yeah. I mean, when I drew my tag, I put 34 lions in a tree before I shot one, you know. And uh, it, so we have to, we had to get away from the mindset of managing predators and start managing our deer and elk. You know, there's no value, and, and not to, that you have to complete, you couldn't get rid of the lions in the state if you want to, but you have to keep them in check. And same with bears, you know, same with coyotes. You know, a lion's no different than a coyote or a wolf if a wolf got down here. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, in the Chalk Creek unit, in the last three years, we've killed over 130 lions. Wow. You know, and, and you put 125 deer per cat on, on that. I mean, it's it's crazy amount of deer. The very first year they went to a harvest objective, we killed over 50 cats, you know, between depredation tags, the landowners, and, and the quota. I mean, we were, we were 50 cats. Well, wasn't you know. most of that in, like, a core area, too? You'd kill a big male, and then, like, literally the next day another male would move oh, in? Oh, yeah. I, I have a map, and I GPSed every animal, every lion we killed, and I put a blue dot for every tom, a red dot for every every female, and... And then, yeah, I mean, I killed 11 toms within two miles of each other, you That's know. Wild. So all of the data that, that the division was going off of and what people thought they knew about lions is, you know, not accurate at all. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I killed a lion that was tagged um, in Colorado and killed it in Chalk Creek. We have wow. a lion that they tagged by mesquite um, right on the Utah line down below St. George that's up east of in Teton Park right now, three-year-old female. So lions are, we have a lion that came right through Chalk Creek the other day, and, and she's got a GPS collar on her, and she's east of Flaming Gorge. So she came from, you know, Spanish Fork and Hobble Creek area to, to Flaming Gorge, a female. So they go back and forth, and, you know, they do have their territories, but it's, it's not a, you know, drop a pin and go 25-mile radius around that pin or 14-mile radius, and there won't be another tom in that area. That's that's absolute baloney. Yeah. You know? Have you been able to see um, a positive impact since that's no, happened? Absolutely. On yeah. yeah. We we have we have the highest fawn recruitment that we've ever had since I've been an outfitter. We have the we have the highest number of yearling deer that we've ever had. We have the highest number of deer per section that we've ever had. Um, and like I said, I couldn't. You, I couldn't kill the lions out if I wanted to. There's multiple multiple areas in the state that have been an unlimited lion tag for for 30 years, you know, and, and guys still book a five day hunt and go down there and kill a cat in five days, and you know, so you, you could, but you you do have to manage them, mm -hmm. and and the division's been great to work with as far as letting us, you know, take the gloves off and manage them until we, because if we're below objective by that far, 50 percent, 70 percent below objective on the herd unit for for the chalk creek area then do what you need to do to 
get your objective back up, you know, and the single biggest thing that we can do to make the fastest uh, impact is predators, you know. If the, and during the winter, if there's a lion on me, I'll know about him and I'll have him killed. Yeah. You know? What, what um, obviously you kind of mentioned coyotes into that equation too. From what you guys have seen over the years, what kind of damage or is there data that's valid as far as their level of success on killing deer? Uh, for sure. Yeah. So our, our coyotes are going up. So we've got more issues with coyotes now because uh, I didn't realize, but like they followed one particular lion ra- around um, last year. It had killed uh, 16 badgers. It had killed 19 coyotes. It had killed, I don't know how many elk, how many deer. So, I mean, lion, lions kill a ton of coyotes. So now that we don't have those lions, we're getting a whole bunch more coyotes. So Interesting. And by far and away, my number one issue for my deer right now is coyotes. They, they kill more deer than lions now. Have you guys seen it up at your place where they're working as like in teams? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, and, they'll, and you know, they obviously kill a lot more fawns than anything, but, but they'll kill a mature deer. They'll kill a mature buck. Just, you know, people don't think that they kill a mature buck. That I mean, they do all the time. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've seen 50 different times where a pack of coyotes will you know, get around a deer and work just like a pack of wolves and, yeah. you know, hang on it and wear it down until they can finally kill it. That's, a, yeah, Eric has some crazy footage from probably like eight, eight or 10 years ago of where he captured like a pack of coyotes surrounding a mature mule deer and killing it. Yeah. And something that you don't see a lot probably in, you know, just like the, the average person trapes around, but certainly seen a lot of situations where there's, you know, three, four, five, six, seven coyotes working together. Oh, yeah. That, that's our biggest problem, and you think about it. But I mean, back in the in the decade or the era that we had so many deer, and you know, your dad or your grandpa was out on the hill, and there were just giant deer everywhere, and tons of them. The the government trappers were still allowed to put out 1080, you know, a form of poison that is canine specific. It would it only kills canines, but it had a seven year kill cycle, so you could treat a carcass and go scattered it around a ranch and if a coyote chews on that bone up for up to seven years, it would, like I have ranchers that I lease from now that are in their late 80s and early 90s that can tell me the very first coyote they saw on their ranch. And they were in their 20s. Wow. Mid 20s before they even saw a coyote. So they, they've exploded and our deer population has shrunk you know yeah so everything has just has to be kept in check yeah you know? i grew up in oregon and so uh it, i was in high school time frame and unfortunately a ballot initiative got on the oregon ballot to re- remove the ability to hunt cats and bears in the state of oregon with dogs mm-hmm. and where we used to hunt as a kid growing up to your point and when my dad was there before i could even hunt the amount of deer and the quality of deer was just unbelievable yeah and then as I got older in my, you know, 20s and, and beyond, like, that area of the country now is just terrible yeah, for decimated. deer hunting. And obviously, as you would expect, you know, the, the cat population's exploded because there's just not a real efficient way to kill them outside of running dogs. dogs. Yeah, there isn't. That's that's by far, in a way, your most efficient way to... But it's it, that's a, a predator that that you can keep in check you know same with bears you know coyotes are are just Mm -hmm. they're so much harder to trap you know your only real good form of keeping coyotes in check is you know harvest them in the winter with a helicopter and if you don't hunt them in the winter with a helicopter then they can explode and you'll you know it's hard enough just to maintain them doing that because you can trap for a whole year and go out calling for a whole year if you kill 20 coyotes in a year 25 coyotes in a year like you know, that's about as many as you can get done. I mean, you'll kill that before noon out of a helicopter. Mm-hmm. So, but, but, uh, a lion and a bear, uh, totally controllable, you know, hunt them during the winter when they're laying a track down or the bears before they den up and, and use your dogs and you can, you can keep those managed. Yeah. So once our objective gets back up to where it needs to be, then we'll lay off of, yeah. you know, how many cats we kill. We'll keep that in check. And, and the nice thing about working with the division is we have, we have 
over 3,000 collared animals in the state now. So deer, elk, moose, lions, you know, we know where they're going, what they're doing. We used to think we know what they did, but that information changes daily. And that's, you know, it, kudos to them for noticing the problem and then making changes to try and fix, you know, yeah. let us hunt them until we get things in check and then, then lay off them. And if we're at objective, then we can maintain. And if we're below, then do the things you need to to bring it back up. How far do you think away you are to getting back to the objective level that you guys want? Uh, I think I've killed enough lions to get us to our objective, but I think our objective, at least in the Chalk Creek unit, which is about a million acres, a um, little under a million acres, uh, we're, I don't know, I think we'll probably see our objective in the next three three years probably. Yeah, that's great to hear. Well, what's crazy is I just got, we went scouting up one of the ranches uh this last weekend and even from the last three years that we've had that ranch um the number of deer since we started putting some control on some lions i mean we saw probably 600 elk and 60 to 100 bucks yeah. in those basins and it was like everywhere you're pointing your glass you were seeing deer and they weren't huge old mature deer but they're that three to five four or five year old that in a couple years, because I think in that, like you said, the 2018 winter killed a whole lot of those mature deer. Oh, yeah. all to where them. now, those are all three, four-year-old bucks that in two, three, four years, it's going to be crazy. Yeah, because yeah, we're, you know, we've I've gone through three winter kills the time in my lifetime as being an outfitter. Uh, none of them had been as bad as 2018, but some, but they've all been bad. And we've rebounded from all of them, but it's taken so much longer than this one will take. I mean, I can, uh, every ranch I have, just like Matt's saying, I can go up and I can physically see a difference by not, by having, you know, a hundred plus less lions in the landscape. It's just so many deer that they kill that. That people don't have any idea how proficient they are mm -hmm. efficient at killing deer you know and they can't process uh rotten meat that's that's half the reason why they kill so many animals a bear can yeah. a bear will kill something and bury it and come back and eat it when it's rotten and full of fly eggs and flies all over it and uh, but a lion can't it can't digest rotten meat so it'll kill something only eat what it wants to eat then when it's hungry the next day it kills something again you know and then your female she she does a lot of killing just teaching her cubs how to kill you know i mean mm -hmm. i come across so many deer that don't have one bite of anything taken off of them they've been killed by a cat and they mm -hmm. just just sport killing you know or teaching their cubs how to kill or whatever so that's been greatly underestimated that's been our, our biggest issue i feel much more than habitat you know everybody says habitats going away for the deer i mean the habitat in chalk creek's better now than it was 30 years ago mm -hmm. you know i mean we have we've cross fence ground we've managed springs we've taken down junipers i mean the ground now is in better shape than it. there's less livestock on it it's getting rotated around i mean the habitat in chalk creek is better than it was when we had so many deer so the habitat's not the problem you know what is the problem mm -hmm. it's not over hunting that's not the problem it's not over grazing i mean the problem is predators you know winter yeah. kills and and then not keeping predators in check yeah. that, that's the, that's the only thing that's changed to make that big of impact to drive our deer numbers down have you noticed like the upswing in elk in the last few years yeah it i have and um they do affect deer at some level but like that's a resource now that it, as a state we need to look at because you know we'll sell out of general season elk tags before you know in four yeah. hours yeah. and and we're looking at ways i'm on a couple committees we're looking at ways where we can give people a guaranteed tag because you don't you can't have a guaranteed deer tag anymore yeah. so some of these limited entry units that's another thing with the with the collaring data we have to manage a unit for an eight and a half year old bull 95 percent of every elk will hit the peak of as big as he's ever going to get when he's six and a half years old so on these units we're managing for eight and a half year old it's a one to one bull cow ratio and you would think when you have that high of bull cow ratio that all your cows are getting bred it's a 50 percent calving on those 50 hmm. percent of every cow is open on a unit that's managed for eight and a half year old bulls 
So you're having half, you're not regenerating the population. They get broken up and they fight so much that the average score on an eight and a half year old bull is smaller than a six and a half year old unit. If people knew the real statistics on drawing a limited entry tag, if you're just jumping into the game now, you wouldn't even do it. Like it's over a hundred years before you even pull a tag. So we're to a point now as a state where, you know, elk is a pretty hardy staple. Like, a, you know, it takes a hell of a bad winter to kill an elk. You know, you about can't kill an elk with a winter. Um, so that's a resource that we need to jump on, especially as an outfitter. Like, if I can't bring my deer numbers up to where they need to be, then I want a strong elk herd. Yeah. You know, because i got to pay a lease regardless of the wildlife, whether I make it off the deer or the elk, or we manage for the deer or the elk. We need to manage for both. Deer just have a lot. It, they have a lot more things going against them to survive. So, but our, our elk numbers are going up. We're going to make some changes in the state to where I feel people now, at least myself and everybody I've talked to, it goes back to, you don't have to harvest an animal for it to be a successful hunt. So you as a new hunter, you know, an issue I have with the state and I've been trying to get changed is you can take your hunter ed and you can't hunt till you're 12. And I've had a 12 year old myself in my household that's put in for a deer tag and just passed hunter ed and doesn't even draw a deer tag. Yeah. So why aren't, why aren't we guaranteeing these tags for the youth as the, you know, versus the 65, 70 year old guy that's killed 50 deer in his life? Why is the youth not getting a tag? Yeah. You know, if we don't get them out in the field and, and I think we're to a point now to where we certainly need limited entry units and units that are managed for trophy quality bulls. But would you rather have something to hunt in the state of Utah every year? put a tag in your pocket and, uh, and have the state manage for maybe a higher volume of elk so you can have a tag go on the mountain and hunt versus not even have a tag at all yeah we're right big, we're big advocates of, of go hunting you know yeah. life short go. you don't know what's going to happen go. yeah i you mean know, getting it, kids out there is so paramount to like continuing this tradition down the ab- road and absolutely it's uh it's interesting man like the, to me, the point system across a lot of Western states is broken, right? Yeah. And, you know, the only advantages for the older folks that are, like, in the game with max points or just below max points yeah. was nothing more than just timing. Yeah. Like, you were at an age financially secure enough to be a part of it when they started. Yeah. That's it. That's but, it. man, for anybody else yeah. that's, like, getting new to hunting kids, adults that are just trying to get into it, to your point, man, you're not going to draw one of these mediocre or above tags. It, you it went from being a once in a lifetime hunt to possibly and probably never in your lifetime, which is wrong in my opinion. Like, yeah, it's a, I, I, I would personally, I and I, I can't speak for everybody, but personally, I would yeah. much prefer uh, a random system like Idaho has, where there's no points. And yeah, yeah you know what your your top tier units are still going to be exceptionally hard to draw, yeah. but at least you're on the same statistical level as any other person sure regardless of how old you are how long you've been putting in for yeah everybody's on an even ground and at least you have a chance at least you have a chance you know yeah. and if you do some studying and you're meticulous in your research you can probably find some opportunities that are there but you got to put in a little effort and i would love to see that change because man all the states out west are getting harder for non-residents to go pull a tag. A lot of them are changing the tag allocation. It's becoming more difficult. And it's unfortunate that as a resident of the state of Utah, it is not easy to get a tag Mm -mm. to go chase elk or deer anymore. No, it's not. And and we're, we're going to change that. I mean, I'm on a, on a elk advisory committee. There's 20 plus people on there. We do a seven year management plan and we're going to address a lot of those issues. You know, the surveys we've been sending out, you know, people want to just be able to go out on the mountain with their family. Yep. You know, but when you could get a deer tag every year, you know, 10 years ago, and it was a guaranteed deer tag. I mean, think about it. In my lifetime, you know, we had a muzzle. I could buy a tag. I could hunt with a bow. If I didn't kill one with a bow, I could hunt with a rifle. If I didn't kill one with a rifle, I could hunt with a muzzleloader in November. And, and the, those have all gone away to where, you know, I may get a tag every two or three or four years. Well, there's and I, and so I don't even hunt for myself. deer around 10 years ago, too. It's yeah. not like... Yeah. It's making that big of an impact. So there's so many things that have changed. And I think people's tolerance level, if if they knew that they were going to get that tag where they could kill a 350 or better bull. So I'm going to, I'm okay with, 
just getting a guaranteed general season elk tag and a deer tag every three or four years. Well, now if there's a chance that I'm not even going to get a general elk tag, so I have nothing to hunt at all, my personal tolerance level for those limited entry units has gone down. If I know that I've got a less than, you know, maybe a hundred years before I pull one of those tags, you know, or 60 or 70 years. I mean, statistically, if you're getting into the game now, you're wasting your time. Yeah. You know, if you have 15 points or less, you're wasting your time. So, you know, what's more important, you know, the 350 bull or, or being able to go on the mountain every year with your, with your friends and family and, and making memories? Because it's not all about just killing something. Yeah, I think I think we have a lot of work to do as a hunting community across the West on figuring this stuff out. And, you know, as uh, more people get interested in hunting, whether it's for the kind of food component or it's from just an interest in joining somebody that inspired you to pick up a bow or a rifle or your own kids, yeah. maybe, that you're getting out there. Yeah. we got to make some kind of changes to get more opportunities in front of these newer, less experienced folks that are just entering into this world. Yeah. And... Um, you know, it's going to be a complex one because you're going to piss off people that have been in the game paying into the system for yeah. long years. But it's obviously not not ideal currently. And, it, you know, yeah, there's got to be a happy medium to kind of, you know, help the folks that have been bought in for a lot of years. Sure. But also a transitional period to get people more opportunities to just go hunt. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. The surveys that we've sent out so far, we give them, you know, they can rate what's a successful hunt. You know, harvesting an animal, number one, being on the mountain with your family and friends, number two, just getting outside. You know, we give them 10 different answers, and harvesting an animal is almost the lowest one rated on there. Everything else is just being out on the mountain with your family Mm -hmm. is the highest rated one. And we put on just, just because I like to hunt. And, you know, that's like the third highest rated one. I just like to hunt, yeah. you know. So, yeah, it's a it's an interesting occupation. I've been, I, I feel more than blessed we're, we're able to do it as an occupation. And, and you know, we're, we're really in a position to where, you know, I tell, I tell our guides this all the time. Um, it's not just about hunting. Like you, you really can have, not only have my guides' lives been impacted by the people that have come and hunted with us, um, just because you meet someone new every five days and you're doing a, you know, it, during the peak of the hunt, if you're full time, you may guide, you know, 16 to 20 clients a year. So you're meeting so many different people from all walks of life. But we also have, you know, they can leave either better than how they came to our camp or they can leave worse. So every five days, you as a guide for RK can do something positive for that guy, whether it's just, or gal, whether it's just listening to him or talking them through something. Because literally, and I tell Andrea this all the time, in five days on the mountain, you will know more about that guy than his wife typically knows about him. You know, you're, you're in a way kind of a, unlicensed therapist (laughs) you wear a lot of hats and you can you can affect it it's amazing how many emails and and cards and phone calls i get from from people all over the world that say i have completely changed my life because the experience i had with matt on the hill Mm -hmm. or you know one particular guide a lady came out a couple years ago and she harvested an elk her first elk and her daughter had died to cancer and they named that ridge where they harvested that elk after her daughter that's awesome man yeah that's just that's the stuff where uh it's to your point it's just so much more than a hunt and i know uh, we've talked to a lot of people know a lot of people that have gone through those really life-changing devastating situations and man there's I'd be hard pressed to find a better place to heal than up on a mountaintop. Yeah, I agree totally. Yeah, I had a client three years ago, and uh, we hunted hard, and he had never killed an elk with his bow, and uh, we got up on top of this tallest mountain, basically the hardest mountain you can hike. We got up there, and he was just crushing it, and so motivated. And I had hunted with him before. This year it was different. And called this bull in to thirty yards comes in raking a tree he makes a perfect shot goes 20 yards tips over dead and he just fell on his hands and knees and started crying and i know this guy he's a successful guy and just what the heck 
so I didn't. I walked over. I'm like, "You good?" He's like, "Yeah, man, just a lot of emotions." Anyways, we go over, get the elk. He goes. He's like, "I gotta go take a leak." Goes and takes a leak. Comes back, and then he's just, just dead. Like just so quiet. Almost doesn't even seem satisfied. And packed the animal off the hill, and it really bugged me. And about three months later, I got an email from this guy. I guess he reached out to Daniel or Andrea. Got my email. And he sent me this long email saying that uh, he had been diagnosed with cancer, thought he had beat it, killed the elk, and that's where he had all of his emotions. Then he went and took a leak, and he was just peeing blood. And he knew that it would come back, come back worse. And uh, he just, it was so, so much emotions. And in his email, he just said that that was one of the highlights of his life. He knew that if he ended up passing due to cancer, that he went down like with one core memory that he'll never forget. And that's something that's changed my life. And he's since beat cancer and has come back, but that's something that I will never forget. And you never take it for granted. I mean, I've hunted with people that are super successful, like billionaire status, and they come to you for info and trust you. And it's something like no other job you can ever have. And you never take it for granted. And hunting can really change people's lives for the better. And I think that gets lost in the shuffle of like alpha mentality or who kills the biggest deer, who's more hardcore. I think that can really get lost in all the, all the noise. Yeah, man. And it doesn't need to go that way. You know, we, we rarely, rarely will you ever see us pull a tape out in camp. You can, you can go from the highest of high and, and then talk, talk score, you know, someone brings up score or whatever, and and then it can, even to people who don't know what a, you know, the score, don't, they don't even know what a 160-inch deer is or 180-inch deer even is. And they're, you know, on as high as they can get, and then you score their deer, and, oh, he's only 170, not 180, and all of a sudden they're deflated. Right. You know, I mean, they're we rarely, we don't ever talk score. It's not about the score. For sure. You know, on our hunts. We, cer- we certainly have ranches where we're, you know, they're sold at a more premium their upper end they are a trophy quality type hunts so we're looking for that particular type of animal but the vast majority of all my hunts is just an average an average hunt well and, the, and they're the funnest ones to do by far sometimes the number just it's, it's convoluted because a lot of people don't have enough time on the mountain or experience and even knowing what that means you know when, no. you, when you see a deer that's 160 inches on a mountainside uh, a lot of guys are going to look at that and be like, uh, "I that is a sweet deer. Can I shoot that deer?" Absolutely. And they have in their mind that might be, you yeah. know, registering as a one eighty buck. It just yeah. doesn't matter. It's like yeah. too, we've never got hung up on that either. We want to f- try to find and challenge ourselves of finding mature, older age class animals. Sure. That could be big. That could be ugly. That could be freaky. Whatever the sure. case may be. Yeah. But we've always fallen back on if it gets you excited, then you know what? Let's go try to yeah, find absolutely. it. Absolutely. Let's go try to make it happen. Yeah. And. Um, you know, I think to to kind of wrap this up, I know you got a, a, some meetings to get to, Daniel. We really appreciate your time. Loved hearing your story about how you built your business with your wife, all the challenges and the trials that you had to kind of push through and persevere to make something happen. But I have so much respect for anybody that takes a risk on themselves, bets on themselves, and just goes after a dream that they have. I think we are all exceptionally fortunate to wake up every day and do something we love and anybody that's listening if you have aspirations or a dream or a goal to be your own boss or to do something as a career of choice that you have passion behind i cannot stress enough to go make it happen take the risk bet on yourself Bet on yourself. That I mean, I, I've done multiple businesses other than just outfitting, but and have have sought out the advice of very successful people, and just to get their opinion before I decide to do something. And it would blow your mind how many how many people I've talked to and got their advice that have told me not to do it. It's, they said that don't do it. That wouldn't. It's not going to turn out good for you for whatever reason. And I've just had a feeling that you know what, I, I know what I can do with it. I'm going to get, and it doesn't hurt to get everybody's, you know, successful sure. people's opinion and advice, but don't underestimate yourself because you ultimately know what you can do yourself. Yeah. And and I've done a lot of things aside from hunting that I was told not to do 
by a lot of very influential people and we've been able to make them successful because I know what I know what I can do and I know what I can do with the help of my wife absolutely which is doubled or tripled so don't underestimate what you can do well speak of the devil <laughs> if uh, if somebody's listening Daniel and they want to they want to inquire about booking a hunt what's the best way to get a hold of you guys um, just call my cell phone probably go to the website my cell phone's on there um, Instagram what I post I don't do s- so much with the website but if you go on instagram just type in rnk hunting company my phone number's on there just give me a call um i call everybody back so if you can't get me leave me a message i you will get called back by me so um and then i can i i want people that our our website's fairly vague just because we have so many different things to op, to offer yeah so get me on the phone and then let me know what you're thinking and i can steer you to the right ranch the right experience what you're looking for because because we have something to, to fit everybody awesome so. well uh we can't thank you enough for joining us we are super fired up to come out and hunt with our hunt winner caleb this october and uh again thank you for sharing your story absolutely thank you guys for doing that we're excited to to uh, keep working with you guys and get people introduced to hunting and and uh yeah this hunt this year is going to be great caleb's going to you can love every minute. Oh, of it, man, so. we can't wait. <laughs> <We did. laughs> All right, guys, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll catch you on the next episode.